no matter what hand you're dealt in life, you try to make the best out of it. I, I, I can't stand woe is me people. You know, it's life. It has its ups and downs. And if you can live your life trying to seek the best out of every person, and sure, you'll get burned sometimes. Trying to seek the best out of every situation, that's what it is. You're the eternal optimist. And I was talking with Katie last night. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about on this podcast. And she's like, it's the eternal optimist. That's who you are. So I choose to live my life happy. And welcome to another episode of the Eternal Optimist Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Drinkon, and I am here with a celebrity. Someone it is on near I say if he's not on the Mount Rushmore, which is maybe maybe exaggerating a little bit, but he is definitely on the Mount Rushmore of PGA professional golfer mustaches, uh, for sure. In fact, he might be the founder, he might be the George Washington of that. Uh, but this is uh, this is my new friend, Mr. Johnson Wagner, and uh, I don't know if he needs an introduction. But I'll, I'll simply say he has won on the PGA Tour multiple times, and he's played in the Masters. And if you look at his background right here on YouTube, it's full of just amazingness. So, uh, Johnson, how are you today, my friend? Matt, I am fantastic, man. Thank you for having me, and that's quite an introduction. Maybe the Mount Rushmore of Virginia Tech golf. That would be more uh, more fitting. Okay. 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 Well, I did see that you were a player of the year and you won some stuff back in college. So I, 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 I'd I, love to talk about some of those accolades. But one of the things we talk about on this show is we talk about the hardships and the tough stuff. Because, I mean, we, we all know that you've, you've made it, you've won, you've been successful. But what is behind the scenes sometimes is like uh, all the hard stuff you have to do to get there and all the hard stuff that you're going through while you're there. And then even as a professional athlete, when you're out of that frame of your career and you're into the next frame, kind of letting go or moving through the next, next phase. So there's so many places that, uh, you know, people who aren't professional athletes, we we don't understand. And I'd love to dive in today and, and see what we can learn from you and have some fun along the way. Uh, so to, uh, to kick it off, can you give us a little background, Johnson? Just if there's three things we should know about you, what are what are three bullet points about Johnson Wagner that might be nice to start with? Well, gr- growing up, uh, I was born in Texas, uh, moved to Tennessee when I was in second grade, and then moved to high school in New York, ninth grade. And I, I, I feel like, you know, to your point about trials and tribulations, like when I was a young golfer in high school and and with aspirations of playing college golf, I wrote letters everywhere. Family in Texas, I wanted to go play at UT or SMU or TCU, Oklahoma, where my whole family went. And then being an East Coast guy as well, I wrote letters to UNC, Wake Forest, all the biggest golf schools. And they all, very few would even have a phone call with me. I went on some college visits and, and, coaches didn't want to talk to me. I was given no real chance. And, and not that I was a, a great junior golfer, but I was very, uh, was not recruited at all to go college, to go to college and play golf. And so I was playing this tournament in Roanoke, Virginia, and it was called the Scott Robertson and the coach at Virginia Tech, where I ended up going, he, he was actually recruiting a player I was playing with. And I, I guess I impressed him. And so he was the only person he offered me a spot at school to play on the team right then and there. And it was the only major division one school that, that offered me any sort of spot to play. And so I guess growing up, I think, I I think kind of what made me have the drive to get better was that nobody wanted me. I was sort of underappreciated and and that kind of built who I was at a young age and, and why I feel like maybe I had success is that, that, that I was always underestimated. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, it certainly played to your advantage. I'm, I'm curious at that golf tournament, the Scott Robinson tournament, when that Virginia Tech coach is there to watch someone else. Did you know who that coach was at the time when you were playing that round? Well, he was wearing Virginia Tech gear. And, and I guess I, I, I assumed he was the coach and I didn't particularly care who he was. I didn't. I, I thought Virginia Tech had the ugliest colors of any school ever, maroon and orange. Now, now I bleed maroon and orange, right? So, uh, but when he, no other coach had ever come up to me. It was all me reaching out and trying to get those sort of offers or just a, a visit, a spot on the team. So I immediately fell in love with Virginia Tech because of Coach Jay Hardwick, because of the way he was impressed by me. And he was the only, the first person to really give me a chance. Hmm. It's, it's amazing that he saw you there. He was there to see someone else, and he saw you and offered you a spot right there on the spot. Uh, and so you assumed he was someone with Virginia Tech, and you, I imagine you scored really well 
uh, right there underneath the pressure. Uh, did you feel any additional pressure that day? I didn't. I, uh, my mom and I traveled down from New York to Virginia and, uh, I kind of played that whole summer, um, okay. traveling around with my mom and, and, and playing in junior golf and sh- no, I, I didn't. It was actually the, the, the most calm I've ever felt shot 69 ended up finishing, I think third in the event. And, uh, you know, it kind of, without that tournament, I, I, I wouldn't be where I was today. Cause I never would have met that coach. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting how life is like just peppered with little spots like that, that that one turning moment to find so much. Uh, take us forward a little bit. Where Where is the next challenge that you, you faced? You, you found someone that would accept you and you got to Virginia Tech. And of course, the rest is history from there. But what was what was the next hardship or challenge you faced? Uh, gosh, I, I feel like I got pretty fortunate in school. I, I played every event all four years. We were pretty, a pretty terrible team. Um, and then a good friend of mine, Brendan DeYoung, who came from Zimbabwe my sophomore year, he pushed me a ton because he came in and was immediately the best player and I was kind of hanging on. So having a, having a, a friend like that to push and challenge, and he was not a hard worker. Yeah. And so I felt like, to get to his level, he was just so naturally gifted. So I, I felt like to get to his level, I had to put in way more time than anybody. So I, I, I felt like uh, to to chase him, I developed some pretty good work ethic as far as what I'm going to practice on, how I'm going to get better, and and always looking up to to kind of reach his skill level. So oh, I've always wanted to ask a, a pro goal for this. So when you say I. I had the work ethic. I had to go practice to get to that level. I wonder how you you practiced. Is it, I'm just going to go hit balls? I'm going to go hit 100 balls the wedge from 50 yards? I mean, how granular or specific or, or general was a practice regimen for you? Well, as it as it progressed, it got very specific. It, when I turned pro, it, it was completely different than it was in college. In college, we kind of had structured practice. We had to hit wedges, hit drivers, hit putt, and and then you could leave after you accomplished everything you went. But as I turned professional, and I was it was solely my motivation to go do it. I developed a lot of different. I I, I found that. I was a great putter always. And so I knew that if I was going to be successful, I needed to be even better at that. So I developed a lot of putting drills and, and basically the focus for me was being the best putter in the world inside 10 feet. And I felt like if I could, if I could achieve that, then I would have a long lasting career on the PGA tour. So it was those, those drills that I, I stole from some other players that I saw great putters doing and I kind of tweaked them to be my own, but yeah, practice session, it's, it's all fluid. Uh, I tried to putt every day. I tried to do a, one drill every day when I went to work. And then other than that, it was basically just what, I was lacking at the time. And and later in my career, it became more about short game and wedge play as opposed to full swing. Hmm. Thank you. I'm taking a business lesson from this, like play to your strengths and keep developing your strengths the way I coached you all the time. So it's good to hear that you leaned into your strength to be the best part of the world. Uh, I, can you take us back to the tour days and share when was a, a time when you feel like you were on cloud nine at your best, uh, that you could remember that just brings you joy. Uh, gosh, it was probably my lap. I played the nationwide tour. Now the corn Ferry tour for four years. And, and that fourth year out there, uh, I, I narrowly missed uh, the PGA tour qualifying school to get my PGA tour card. And so I went back out with one goal for that season. And that was to graduate. There was 20 spots at the time. I ended up winning, I think the fourth event of the year and just every single week, I was on the t- on the leaderboard. I finished. I think I had seventeen top twenty fives in twenty two events. Was just always there. I ended up winning a second time. Finished second on that money list, and it was I was unstoppable. My wife was traveling. My wife was traveling with me. We got married that summer. Um, we were traveling in a motorhome, and it was just like life couldn't possibly get any better. This was before kids. We had no real worries our address was wherever we were on the road. And uh, I just remember, you know, everything came real easy that year. Oh, what a great story. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, the times before kids, that's, that's for a different conversation, but man, times <laughs> before kids carefree. Uh, so uh, how do you sleep nowadays, by the way? Cause you, you say that, I guess that you might have children now. So how, 
how is how's sleeping now? <laughs> uh, a fourteen year old and a twelve year old, and and uh, I've never slept the same since they were born. You got the same? <laughs> yeah, eight, seven, and five. So we're still in that place where we sleep most nights. Uh, we're not to teenage yet, so they still listen. <laughs> My my son, he's fourteen, and he's unbelievable. He uh, they're at the point now on the weekends where they go to bed way later than we do. <laughs> we, we, we my wife and I get in bed about ten o'clock, nine o'clock, and they they stay up late. So it uh, life gets really good when they get older. You don't have, I mean, they're not driving yet, so I think that that's going to bring a whole new bag of uh, worries with sleepless nights. But yeah, I don't I don't sleep like I like I used to. Uh, I don't like medicating for sleep either. So I just kind of toss and turn and wake up early and go on my way. Interesting. Well, you say medicating for sleep. Uh, what, what does that mean? Medicating I, for sleep? I have some friends that, that take Ambien or, or did yeah. for a while. And I just, uh, I, I've never been one to, to want to do that. I, I don't want to wake up feeling a certain way. I, now that being said, I, I, I'm not opposed to having a, you know, a, a bourbon at night to maybe help me fall yeah. asleep. So maybe I'm being a little, uh, mean or judgmental for people that take pills. I just, I'm not a pill guy. I don't want, uh, I don't want to have to rely on something to, to fall asleep every night. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Uh, so I'm going to come back to the next question I was going to ask you about, uh, you've just shared the highs and, and that great feeling in that corn fair year. And then on the other side of the equation is the challenges. You know, what was the if you can think back to your career, what's the, the, the low point or the most challenging point where you were questioning or doubting or just what was hard? Well, with, with golf, as you know, uh, golf is way more lows than it is highs. So there's many, many possibilities for me to choose from. But uh, my rookie year, 2007 on the PGA Tour, started off hot was making cuts, was making money. Uh, I thought life was easy. It was just going to be, a, I was going to, my career was going to be on cruise control. And I, I think there was a stretch in the middle of the summer where I missed 13 out of 14 cuts. And I had started the year so well, I thought I was going to keep my card for the following season. It was just, it was just gravy train. And uh, climbing out of that hole was was the the hardest thing I've ever done. It was just down, 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 playing every week, and just it was like the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting mm-hmm. the same result. And finally, I was on the I was on the brink of losing my card. There was five events left in the year, and and I, I kind of developed a, a an ability that my my back was against the wall, and sometimes I felt like that was when I played my best golf. Like I have to. I have five events. I need to. I need to play great at least in one event to keep my job. And so I, I, I found that um, the pressure of losing my my card, my job, uh, really inspired me to work harder and to focus more. Because when, as you know, in golf, when when you lose your focus, everything goes. And and so when my back was against the wall, I, I developed this ability to focus in. There's one task. I don't have a run of tournaments to do this in. I have to do it right now. Yeah. How was it like when you're living on the road at that time? How, how are the conversations with you and your wife? You're newly married and you're in this big rookie year, you're crushing it, and then you go from high to low. How is, how is your relationship at that time? Uh, I think she knows me so well. She knew when to avoid me and when to engage. And I, I, yeah. I, 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 I do think I was pretty hard to deal with because – you know, like pre kids, golf was my life. I didn't, it, everything I did revolved around it. So I was so singularly minded that there was nothing other than that. And I think that was part of the problem was that everything was focused on one thing and, and, and not anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd say one more question around the golf, uh, for, for those of us out here who are low handicappers or scratch golfers who might, see someone on TV hit a poor shot and say, man, Mito Pereira, I can't believe you hit it on the 72nd hole in the water on the right at the PGA Championship last year. How would you do that? I mean, I would have hit it on the left. I mean, what do you say to the people at the armchair quarterback who are saying, man, they're, they're just, I, I can do that. Anything that we don't know that you could tell us from the tour life. Well, I mean, nerves are a crazy thing, right? So when you're yeah. on the 72nd hole on the precipice of winning your first major championship, 
your body feels completely different than it ever normally would have. And, and I've, I've always said about nerves, like if you harness your nerves in the right way, you're capable of doing things extraordinarily well. If nerves overtake you in a negative way, then you are capable of doing things extraordinarily poor that you wouldn't normally do. So uh, I think for Mito, that one specific thing, I think the nerves just took over, his hands got tight and he went right. Like until it's easy to second guess people's decisions, but until you are put in that position and feel what your body feels like in its most raw uh, environment, like, and he handled it beautifully that entire day, but it just yeah. one moment and then it just, it's a lapse in mental focus. I just, uh, nerves are a funny thing. Yeah. When can you take us to a time when you felt them like the most, if that connects <laughs> <laughs> for, for the most, for the most positive way. Yes. I was, uh, it was 2015, the shell Houston open. Um, yes. I was, my, my dad was in the hospital, uh, with, you know, he had just had a lung removed or part of his lung removed. And I had visited him earlier in that week and then flown back out to Houston. And I was so there was, I was on a one track mind and, and I, I knew I needed a guy had posted on Sunday, a score and I needed to birdie 17 or 18, which were the two hardest holes on that golf course, missed 17 in a bunker, almost hold it out, made the 10 footer. And I get to 18 hardest hole on the golf course. One of the hardest holes on the PGA tour. I yeah. rip it down the middle. I hit a four iron to 20 feet and I knew there was no other place that ball was going other than the hole. I, and I, I buried it fist pumped. It was, it was, it was like, I just willed it to happen. I ended up losing on the second hole of that playoff, but I, I had complete command over my mind and my body in a high stress situation. And now on the negative side, there's been plenty of times when I go into the last hole on a Friday, I've got to make the cut. All I need to do is make a par and I get so overcome by nerves. I get it up there around the green, chip it to six feet and we just completely miss the putt. And, and so there's just, you know, I, I've, it, it's, harnessing what makes you great is something I think a lot of athletes, especially golfers try to, they strive for their whole lives is being able, okay, how did I do that that one time? And how can I, how can I make that happen regularly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after your first win on tour, what was it like your first, uh, your first couple times playing uh, Augusta number 12, what was going through your mind when you got there the first couple times? <laughs> I mean, I, I, well, when I won, I won in Houston the week before mm -hmm. the masters. So flew straight to Augusta, was playing a practice round early Monday morning. And I was just that whole week, cloud nine, pinching myself, couldn't believe yeah. I was there. Uh, I mean, 12 and a, a friend who had played the masters a bunch. And I played some practice rounds with Sergio Garcia that week. And when you get on 12, there's only one thing to do. You hit it over the center of the bunker, no matter where the pin is, you do not go flag hunting. If you push or pull and it happens to get close, fine. But your goal is to hit it right over the middle of the bunker into the center of the green, two putt for par and move on. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because us, us people, I've still never been to Augusta. I watch it on TV and I always see it on Sunday. No one ever hits it right at the pin. People rarely hit it close to the pin. You know, so it's good to hear even the pros just hit over the middle of the bunker. <laughs> yeah. Right uh, in the middle of the green, no other spot. Good. Good. Well, if, if we keep moving forward, Johnson, uh, I, I mean, I'd love to just keep drilling golf questions all day, but I, I know that there are other challenges that you have either faced or are facing. I'd love to go forward a little bit past 20. Let's just say you shared a story at 2015 at the Houston open. So from 2015 till now, what's, something that's been challenging that you can share with us? Yeah. I mean, uh, just a year ago, um, really, I would say 2000 since COVID, I, I the, dealing with the end of my career, I, I had never wanted to do anything other than play professional golf. And, and the last couple of years were extremely stressful. I wasn't getting many starts, was playing maybe 10 events a year, wasn't making any money, had all these savings from a nice career, started just plowing through savings, having a lifestyle that needed income, uh, have two kids that are in private school. And, and I, I, I struggled with the what's next for me. I'm young. I still need to work. I'm passionate about the game of golf. And I, I, I went through many ideas of what my next chapter was going to be. And it, it was, it was some low points, like sleepless nights. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to provide for my family? Um, and, and a friend out of the blue who I played high school golf with, who had worked at the, the golf channel forever as a researcher, 
he called me and said, Hey, uh, there's a team of producers here that would like for you to come up and do a trial week with golf channel. Do you have any interest in doing television? And it, it was, I felt like an immediate infusion of, of, uh, of, of, of purpose. And, and, and so yeah. that's what I've been doing for the last year. And, but I'm, I'm telling you, but before that, I've never been so lost home all the time, nothing to do, uh, making a lot of bad decisions, which I do often. And I still make bad decisions, but, um, was, was drinking way too much and, uh, just living a, a purposeless life. Was there a moment that you realized this, that you it came down to this defining moment where you pulled it together and then went forward with the purpose. Was it when that friend called or what got was, you back on was, track? I was actually on the golf course playing with a friend uh, who was a successful business guy. Uh, and I was talking to him about trying to start a business for myself where I, I mean, everything in my life revolves around golf. It still does. It always will. And I, I was trying to figure out if I could, you know, offer my services to companies to go play with clients or if, if I needed to get a real job or whatever it was. And we were actually on the golf course talking about what that might look like when this friend called. It was uh, things of, I, I, I consider myself a very fortunate person and your you know show is called The Eternal Optimist. I feel like that describes me very well. I'm a glass half full guy. Things are going to work out. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do things. I'm happy. So um, it, it, it kind of fell in my lap, honestly. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, you, you put it out there in the universe. Somehow it, it has a way of finding you. And th it's not shocking to hear that you are on TV, that you're around golf, because it's really easy to talk with you. It's really easy to listen to you talk about golf. Uh, so I'm curious, the first time that you got on TV, not as a player, but now as a broadcaster, what, is it, what was the difference? What did it feel like that was different than being a player? <laughs> that first day, you kind of, I was, I was doing a studio show. It's like the sports center of the golf channel called golf central. And mm -hmm. you get in there hours before you go on camera and you're watching the golf, you're taking notes, you're learning. I had no idea. Nobody told me what to do. I, it was the mo it was that day was the most nervous. I mean, first tee of my first U S open, I was way more nervous that day in the studio. And I get at this desk and I'm with this host who I'd barely seen all day. She was you know, doing her own thing, uh, a, a veteran of, of the broadcasting world. And that red light came on the camera and I was absolutely petrified and it got easier throughout that week, but yeah. it was the most nervous I've ever been in my life. Man, I so relate to you. Thank you for sharing the human side of this. Uh, uh, I, I I felt that way when I started coaching girls soccer of six year olds. I felt like I was on display and and I speak in public all the time. And I don't have nerves there. I got so nervous coaching a girls soccer team. And like you played in front of hundreds, thousands, been on TV in front of millions, and that didn't bother you. But the first time you're broadcasting, uh, it's thank you for thank you for the human side of it. <laughs> well, it's it's something like playing golf. I had trained my whole life and there were baby steps, right? I, I played on, we had cameras and a little bit of crowds on the corn Ferry tour. And then, you know, it, it was just an evolution to be on camera on the PGA tour. And I, I'm telling you, not having ever done any sort of, of TV, it was, it was terrifying. <laughs> it was, I, I'd actually, it would be interesting to go back and rewatch that first thing and see how far I've come in a year just because my comfort level's there. Yeah, what's it like for you now, a year in? It's it's a blast. I absolutely love it. It's uh, live TV. Uh, a friend of mine, Gary Williams, who's used to be with Golf Channel, he's a golf legend in the broadcasting world. He told me before going up that first week, he said, he said when you're done with a live television show, <laughs> even if it's a late one, he said it's like two, three hours before you come down. And that that's exactly... He's spot on doing live TV. It gets me going. I love preparing for it. I, I never had a, a team of people. And so with, with doing live TV, you've got the cameramen, you've got producers, researchers, and you've got this huge team of people around it. And, and I just love every single aspect of it. It, it, it is, it, I, I'm, I'm feeling more fulfilled professionally now than I have in a long, long time. Mm, nice. Well, so I'm curious, kind of transitioning, you're, you're feeling very fulfilled right now, and you love it, and your bi-language is just so 
congruent with this. It's just you're, it's pouring out of you this passion for it. So what's next? If you look forward five, ten years, are we going to see Johnson uh, staying with broadcast? Is what, what do you see for your future? Yeah, I'm 43, so I've got seven years before the senior tour for golf, the Champions Tour. Um, ah. I don't know. My golf game's pretty terrible now. I worked 30 weeks this year for for TV, so I did not play a ton, which is people think when you work in the golf business, oh, you must play a ton. No, I watch a ton, and I talk about it a lot, but I don't play much. Um, I love what I'm doing. I just signed a new two-year deal uh, with NBC Golf, and I... Nice going to see how it goes these next two years. If I keep having the passion that I have for it now, I I would like to, I was actually talking about this with my brother the other day. I want to, I want to know what my ceiling is in the broadcasting world to get to the highest level. You have to have certain credentials. If you want to be the lead analyst for NBC sports on the U S open, traditionally you have to be a major champion. And so I don't know if that is my ceiling or whatever it is. I want to break through it and I want to get to the highest level I can. It's kind of the way I looked at playing golf. I want to be the best I can at this. I I don't feel like maybe I underachieved a little bit in golf, but coming from someone who was not very, not recruited at all to play college golf to winning three times on tour, I can look back on my career and think, you know what? I'm happy with that. And so with the TV thing, I want to, I want to be as good as I can and get to the highest possible level. Yeah, and you, you proved that when you were playing on tours. So what might be a strategy to get to the top of your game in broadcasting? Like, How do you practice, if you will, broadcasting or, or level up the skill? I think it's, it's all just, preparation, which is the same with playing golf, right? You practice, mm-hmm. you work to go perform. So I've learned from a lot of guys that, that I've worked with uh, and ladies that I've worked with. It's all about prep. So I'm working next week and I've, or I've started my prep early. I'm, I'm digging into the field of players. I'm going deeper in backgrounds. I'm watching them. I'm watching swings on YouTube so I can be more prepared when I see something. And, and, and like the preparation, if I, if I prepare and I'm hundred percent prepared, I may use only five to 10% of what I've prepared, but I've got it in my back pocket for later on. So I think how I'm going to get better is better preparation. Better preparation. Thank you. Oh, great answer. Uh, okay, so you did lay the lay the, the yellow brick road to the senior tour here in seven years. So uh, th- that sounds interesting. Is that uh, kind of a dream out there possibly for us? I mean, I, uh, Katie, my wife, we talk a lot how fun it would be. Our kids will be grown and, and out of college. And we traveled for five years in an RV. And so uh, we talk a lot like how fun would it be to get another RV and go out and, and, and travel the country again on the champions tour. But I don't know them. I don't know if I keep down this road, I don't know that my skill level will be good enough to compete out there, but uh, that's something I will start thinking about in, in three, four years. So we hear, like I saw that uh, we're recording this right now on December 1st, 2023. I saw Tiger came back and played the tournament yesterday. And I think he shot three over, uh, it's like in 18th place or something in the Hero World Challenge. And I'm curious the difference between someone who's, who's in practice in tournament shape and a, tur- a touring pro who's not in tournament shape. Like, wh- where are you right now compared to tournament shape? And how would you need to, what do you need to do to get back to tournament shape? I, I th- well, you, the only way to get in tournament shape is to play tournaments. And so I okay. would probably, if I had three weeks with nothing to do, I could go compete and make a cut on the PGA tour. Um, but come Sunday, if I was in contention, I would be so raw and nervous that it would, it would, it would break me down. Uh, Tiger hasn't played since last February. Yeah, no, he played. That's not wrong. He, he played the masters in April, but he is, he's an enigma. The guy only played 15 events every year, his entire career. He has the mental, he has the mindset that he can do what other people can't do. So, uh, he played beautifully yesterday and I'm looking forward to watching him the rest of the week. And he's talking like he's going to come back and, and, and play maybe a handful of tournaments next year. So he, he's proven time and time again, he can come back from injury. He can come back from anything. Uh, so tiger is in a whole different realm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how many times have I watched on YouTube that uh, Canadian open shot from the bunker on the 72nd hole? I mean, oh my gosh. Uh, and he hit a six iron. You know, put me in the fairway with a four iron from there. And I don't know how many times it would take to hit that shot. <laughs> I've played I've played that hole uh, 
so many times and, and I could have a, you put me in a pitching wedge to that pin, that right pin, and I'm not hitting it at it like he did. <laughs> the guy is, the guy is ridiculous. Yes. Yes. Well, so thanks for, thanks for sharing what we have so far. I'm curious, John. So where might we find out uh, more? Is it just, we watch you on golf channel. I mean, how do we, how do we follow you and uh, see how your journey progresses? I'm really trying to dive into social media a little bit more. I think unfor- uh, something that I've kind of shied away from my whole career, but I, I know how important it is. So I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I've got a yeah. starting a podcast, uh, kind of contribute to it's called the five clubs podcast with Gary Williams wow. and my friend, Brendan DeYoung. So we're just kind of getting going there. Um, and I'll be, you know, on golf channel. I've already got my schedule for next year. I'll be on 17 weeks, both in the studio and on the live golf broadcast. So, uh, I'm not going to give you my whole schedule right now. I don't think we have time for yeah. that, but, uh, I'm, I'm around. I, I've been doing some serious XM PGA tour radio work as well. Um, I, I fill in on a, on a radio show called gravy and the sleaze Monday through Wednesday, 12 to two. I'm on there eh, every other week or so, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself out there. My wife told me, uh, last year she said, uh, <laughs> she said you're flooding the market. So, uh, I ho- hopefully this year we'll settle down a little bit and I'll be a little more, um, a little more, uh, steady with just radio and, and golf channel, but, uh, I'm, I'm trying to put myself out there any way I can. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm super curious here because you have the most amazing shelf of trophies and awards and things right behind you. And, and I love it. And I'm curious, there is just one thing that stands out. It's different. You have a, like a grateful dead bear of some kind. What is, what is this bear in the background? What's the story of that? Yeah, it's a, I'm a huge grateful dead fan, uh, deadhead. You could say it's just the dancing bear. My, one of my old caddies, <laughs> saw it at some it's it's made out of like uh, steel and he saw it at some uh antique shop or something and got it for me and gave it to me for christmas a few years ago and i love it so much it just kind of had to have a prominent spot absolutely cool cool well johnson if there is um if there is a book or a couple of books that have had an impact in, in your life what might one or two books that have had an impact in your life be Uh, gosh, that's an awesome question. I, I, I mean, I'm going to go away from golf here a little bit. Uh, I'm a native American, uh, not, not a ton. I'm one, one twenty eighth native American Chickasaw. There's a book called empire of the summer moon. It happens to be the last book I read. Uh, and it is, a. I grew up in Amarillo, Texas. And this, this book is about, I'm Chickasaw, but it's about the uh, Comanche Indians and, and how, of what a force they were, back in the 17, 1800s, they were a great horseback tribe. And they basically, their territory was from, you know, Colorado all the way down through Mexico in the central plains. And, uh, it just, it, it shed light, like how, how short life is and how 200 years ago was not that long ago. And, and, and the world that we live in is so broad and how things can change rapidly. Like I grew up in Amarillo, Texas, which I feel like was forever ago in 1980 when I was born, but just a hundred years before that, 150 years before that, there were Comanche Indians owning that property and running people away left and right, sometimes brutally. And how far civilization has come in that long, it, it just kind of blew my mind. Wow. Super cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's go music next. If there is a specific, uh, we just said Grateful Dead. So if, if there's a song or an artist or a genre, just anything specific that, uh, that fills your bucket, what might that be in music? I, I, I like uplifting music. I, I don't like real downer stuff. Um, okay. Even though some people would say the Grateful Dead is a bit downer. Uh, and John Mayer has, has started playing with the Grateful Dead. Uh, and they're called Dead and Company. Um, I, I really huh. like, I, I've turned into a bit of a John Mayer fan. Uh, I went to see him. That was probably the last concert I went to about a month ago. Uh, s- saw Chris Stapleton pretty recently. Really like Chris Stapleton. Um, I'm getting more into country. Growing up middle school in Nashville, Tennessee, I felt like I was inundated with country music. So it was something I always shied away from. But I think there's some really good uh, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors out of Nashville. They're incredible. He's a married guy, Christian loves golf gotten to play with him a bunch and his music is is all about his family his kids and it's very uplifting stuff so i'm i i i'm digging some drew holcomb okay 
Uh, so a little bit of a curveball here. And my second to last question, I'd love to hear the origin story of how you and your wife got together at Virginia Tech and had that first date. How did that come to be? <laughs> we, she played soccer at Virginia Tech. And so we lived in the same dorm. Um, and one of my buddies uh, on the golf team actually had a crush on her. Uh, and <laughs> I don't think it was reciprocated, but she came up to our dorm room one time uh, to help him study. And that was the first time we met and we became friends and we were friends for gosh, about a year until the end of our sophomore year. And we lived uh, at that point, we lived off campus and kind of neighboring townhome communities. And she came over one night and we were hanging out partying. And, and I just said, Hey, can I take you to a movie tomorrow night? And we went and saw Gladiator uh, with Russell Crowe. Oh, great, nice. great movie. Great, well, not maybe not the best first date movie, but we've been together. We've been, we've been together ever since, and it's it's nice. She's you know a lifelong partner, and and she's my best friend I've ever had. Awesome, dude! I so love that you said Gladiator because I had a date uh, once upon a time with someone, and I took her to see Ray Liotta in No Escape the prison island movie. Uh, So I'm glad that another male out there thought to take the woman of his dreams to a violent gladiator like movie. Thank you. (laughs) That was awesome. My girlfriend in high school, I took to see the rock. You remember that with Sean Connery? It's about Alcatraz. And and she, this is kind of when I knew it wasn't going to be it for us. She made me leave halfway through the movie. It was too violent and gory. And so when, when, when Katie was able to sit through gladiator and loved it, I was like, this one's the one right here. Dude, The Rock is such a great movie. Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery back and forth in that movie are great. I remember the one line, winners go home and talk to the prom queen. Uh, such a great, great movie. I, I love that one. Um, well, okay, well, I don't normally ask this. I'll ask you this. How about movie? If you had to name like your top couple movies, what's the what's on the top two Mount Rushmore of your your movies, Johnson? I'm a I, surprisingly. I just said I like uplifting music. I'm a Quentin Tarantino <laughs> fan, so I love nice. all his stuff. Pulp Fiction, I think, obviously is the best. Um, and there was a there was a movie. My my college roommate and teammate Brendan DeYoung's from Africa. He's from Zimbabwe. And there's a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio called Blood Diamond that I find Ooh. absolutely fascinating. I think Leonardo DiCaprio's South African accent in that movie is ridiculous and uh that's if i had to pick one movie to watch it would be blood diamond heck yeah what a super cool movie dude you're hitting like the movies because we're about the same age you're hitting the movies that i know i when he walks up to jennifer Connolly at that bar he's like oh. got you timber uh, like <laughs> what a cool scene uh just always oh, such a cool dude no every movie uh man well so last question johnson would be uh Something I ask every guest on the show, when you hear the words Eternal Optimist podcast, what does Eternal Optimist mean to you? It it means someone who is always looking, no matter what hand you're dealt in life, you try to make the best out of it. I I, I can't stand woe is me people. Uh, You know, it's life. It has its ups and downs. And if you can live your life trying to seek the best out of every person and sure you'll get burned sometimes trying to seek the best out of every situation that's what it is you're the eternal optimist and i was talking with katie last night i was like i don't know what i'm going to talk about on this podcast and she's like it's the eternal optimist that's who you are so i choose to live my life happy i choose to see the best in people so eternal optimist i think is that